Alcatraz vs. the Evil Librarians, Chapter 4. Hushlanders, I'd like to take this opportunity to commend you for reading this book. I realize the difficulty you must have gone through to obtain it. After all, no librarian is likely to recommend it, considering the secrets it exposes about their kind. Actually, my experience has been that people generally don't recommend this kind of book at all. It is far too interesting. You have had other kinds of books recommended to you. Perhaps even you have been given books by friends, parents, or teachers, then told that these books are the type you have to read. Those books are invariably described as important, which in my experience pretty much means that they're boring. Words like meaningful and thoughtful are other good clues. If there's a boy in these kind of books, he will not go on an adventure to fight against librarians, paper monsters, and one-eyed dark arculators. In fact, he will not go on an adventure to fight against anything at all. Instead, his dog will die, or in some cases, his mother will die. If it's a really meaningful book, both his dog and his mother will die. Apparently, most writers have something against dogs and mothers. Neither my mother nor my dog dies in this book. I'm rather tired of those types of stories. In my opinion, such fantastical, unrealistic books, books in which boys live on mountains, families, work on farms, or anyone has anything to do with the Great Depression, have a tendency to rot the brain. To combat such silliness, I've written the volume you now hold, a solid, true account. Hopefully, it will help anger you in reality. So when people try to give you some book with a shiny round award on the corner cover, be kind and gracious, but tell them that you don't read fantasy, because you prefer stories that are real. Then come back here and continue your research on a cult of evil librarians who secretly rule the world. This, Grandpa Smedry proclaimed, pointing to Singh, is your cousin Singh, Singh Smedry. He is a specialist in ancient weapons. Singh nodded modestly. He had exchanged his tunic for what appeared to be a formal kimono. Though he still wore his dark sunglasses, the kimono was of a very rich dark blue silk, and though it fit him quite well, there was something wrong about the entire presentation. It wasn't just the fact that the kimono itself wasn't something a regular person in America wore. Singh's chest parted the front of the silk, and a loose garment hung tied about the waist with a large sash stuck beneath his massive stomach. Uh, nice to meet you, Singh. Singh, I said. You just call me Singh, the large man replied. Ask him what his talent is, Grandpa whispered. Oh, I said, um, what's your talent, Singh? I can trip and fall to the ground, Singh said. I blinked, that's a talent? It's not as grand as some, I know, Singh said, but it serves me well. And the kimono, I asked. I come from a different kingdom than your grandfather, Singh said. I am from Okia, where your grandfather and Quentin are from Maryland. Melorand. Okay, I said, but what's di what difference does that make? It means I have to wear a different disguise from the rest of you, Singh explained. That way I won't stand out as much. If I look like a foreign in America, people will ignore me. I was. Whatever, I finally said. It makes perfect sense, Grandpa Spedro said. Trust me, we've researched this. He turned and pointed to the other man. Now, this is your cousin Quentin Spedro. Short and wiry. Quentin wore a sharp tuxedo like that of Grandpa Spedro, complete with a red carnation on the lapel. He had a dark brown he had dark brown hair, pale skin, and freckles. Like Singh, he looked to be about thirty years old. Well met, young oculator, Quentin said from behind his dark sunglasses. And what is your talent? I dutifully asked. I can say things that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. I thought everyone here had that talent, I noted. Nobody laughed. Three kingdoms never get my jokes. He's also really sneaky, Grandpa Spencer said. Quentin nodded. Great, I said. So are both of you oculators? Oh, goodness no, Singh said. We're cousins to the Spencer family, not members of the direct line. Didn't you notice the glasses? They're wearing warrior's lenses, one of the only kinds of lenses that a non-oculator can use. Um, yes, I said. Actually, I did notice the glasses. I noticed the tuxedos, too. Is there a reason you dress like that? If we go out like this, we'll kind of stand out, right? Maybe the young lord has a point, Singh said, rubbing his chin. Lord, I thought I had no idea what to make of that. Should we get Alcatraz a disguise, too, Lord Smedry? Quentin asked my grandfather. No, no, Grandpa Smedry said. He isn't supposed to wear a suit at his age. At least I don't think. I'm fine, I say quickly. The collection of Smedries nodded. Now, many of you Hushlanders may be scoffing at the disguises used by the Smedry group. Before you pass judgment on them, realize that they were somewhat out of their element. Imagine if you are suddenly thrust into a different culture with very little knowledge of its customs or fashions. Would you know the difference between a, a, a Runesfield tunic and a Larkian tunic? Would you be able to distinguish when to wear a Batold and when to wear a Carhu? Car would you even know where you wrap a Carl Flogian wicker strap? No, well that's because I just made all of those items up. But you didn't know that, did you? Yeah, but my point is proven. All things considered, I think the Smedgers did quite well. I've seen other infiltration teams, ones without Grandpa Smedgers, who is widely held as the Three Kingdoms' foremost expert in American culture and society. 
Lots of people that tried an infiltration without him ended up trying to sneak into the Federal Reserve Bank disguised as potted plants. They got watered. I'll be ready then, Campus Measure said. My grandson will be landing this infiltration. Him will be leading this infiltration. Our target is a central downtown library. Singh and Quentin glanced at each other, looking a bit surprised. Grandpa had mentioned the library infiltration to Singh, but apparently the downtown library was not what he'd expected. It made me wonder once again what I was getting myself into. I realize that this would be a most ambitious mission, gentlemen, Grandpa Spencer said, but we have no choice. Our goal is to recover the legendary sands of Rashid, which librarians have acquired through some very clever scheming and plotting. Grandpa Smedry returned nodding to me. The sands belong to my grandson, and so he will be the calculator on the mission. Once we've reached the initial stacks, we'll split into two groups in search for the sands. He has as much information as he can and recover the sands at all costs. Any questions? Quentin raised his hand. What exactly did this bag of sands do? Travis Medry wavered. We don't actually know, he admitted. Before this, nobody had ever managed to gather enough of them to smelt the lens. At least nobody had managed to do it during our recorded history. There are vague legends, however. The lens of Rashida is supposed to be very powerful. They will be a great name to the people of the Three Kingdoms if they are allowed to fall into the librarian's hands. Then fell silent. Finally, Singh raised a meaty hand. Does this mean I can bring weapons? Of course, Grandpa Smedry said. So I'm going to leave off on page 56, and I will pick back up tomorrow, or in the next episode. Guys, Mr. Evil Librarians, chapter 4, page 56.